I'm a teacher for um, uh, students with uh, profound and multiple learning difficulties. And um, these are the students that um, we wouldn't normally do online work with. Um, I also, but my school is an all age school with um, a range of abilities and differences. So I'm going to focus on our, uh, our students with PMLD um, just for this first part. And then we'll then I'll talk a little bit about what we're planning to do with for our students who've got a range of differences um, and disabilities, um, but also have English as a language. And I'll talk a bit about that as well. So our PLD students, uh, if someone had said to me um, a year ago that they'd like to set up remote learning for them, I'd have laughed because it's really not something we would do, um, and it's not perfect. But I'm pleasantly surprised by um, how much fun it has been. Um, but I'm going to echo some of what all of the other speakers have said, that if, you're, if you want to do this, we'll all have to think a bit differently about what we, what we think of as um, helpful and useful for um, this set of students. If we want to replicate our lessons and do live sessions a day of um, work for students with PMLD, um, that won't work. And some of our sessions that we do uh, in our classrooms also won't work. So we shouldn't beat ourselves up about that. But what does work? And I found that um, sessions that are heavily led by the team work really well because of, for obvious reasons, because you're the one, you can't have any sensory content in a, uh, delivered by the teacher in the way that you might in the classroom. So sensory stories work brilliantly. What we do is um, I'm doing them, but I'm doing them in a really different way to how I would do it in the classroom. So I'm using text and sharing it from uh, Kindle. So if you, uh, which allows the parents to sort of see um, that any book can be sensory because we, they tend to think that you need to have some kind of special books or the teacher needs to write the story themselves or it has to be then converted to a PowerPoint, it really doesn't. Um, I'm doing a story called The Disgusting Sandwich, which is brilliant, by the way, has very little text. You can make the text as complicated as you like or ask questions if you wish to. Um, and it can be used with a range of young people. And it's very cheap on Kindle and you can share your screen um, and just allow the parents to experience it that way. What I do is I send a list before um, to the parents for suggested resources. We don't read the book all the way through. We have short sessions. My sessions for teaching are no longer than 20 minutes because uh, the uh, suggestion is that most people can't focus for more than 40 minutes um, on Zoom. It is not the same. Um, as being in the real world. So any more than that is way too much screen time for our students. Uh, then I ask the parents to bring the resources, which really influences what I'm going to share, uh, what kind of story. So in school, I might be doing um, myths and legends and all kinds of things like that, but the parents aren't gonna have the resources at home. So it matters what you choose. So the disgusting sandwich is great because people have got bread, and put cheese. It doesn't matter what resources they use. What matters is how you are um, supporting them to use those resources. And we do two or three pages each day, uh, um, each time that we do it. And it's done so the story builds on itself. So you add more pages as you go. And the parents get more experienced at doing it. And you get more experienced at doing it. We don't use Google Classroom, we're using Zoom, but that's because our parents have overwhelmingly said that's what they want to use. Um, so we have a Zoom contract with our parents because it isn't GDPR. Um, and as far as we can tell, that's okay. 